God bless you. It is so good to once again share with you the message of God, um, the word of the Lord, and bring this study to you as it corresponds this day. And we are going to see chapter 28, which we can say that this is the settling of accounts of God with King Saul. We're going to see his decline. We're going to see the death of King Saul in the next chapter. Very tragic, very sad, uh, but the Lord had warned him and he knew beforehand that he had been rejected because of his disobedience. And so we are going to read the first verses. Go with me to 1 Samuel chapter 28 and we're going to read the first verse in this moment. And it says, and so... Now it happened in those days that the Philistines gathered their armies together for war to fight with Israel. And Achish said to David, You assuredly know that you will go out with me to battle, you and your men. And so in this moment, we are going to be speaking. We're not going to be speaking about David. Remember that David is in the land of the Philistines. He is in the land of the enemies that are already gathered together to fight against Israel, but since David is there with King Achish in the land of the Philistines, and he has constituted himself as a servant, and so the adjustments or settlement of accounts will come for David as well, because Achish says, hey, uh, get ready. In other words, don't forget that you are going to, you and your men are going to war with me against Israel, because he took him as his servant. But now we are going to focus in what we are going to work with today, and it is chapter 28, focused in Saul. In verse 3, it says, Now Samuel had died, and all Israel had lamented for him and buried him in Ramah, in his own city. And Saul had put the mediums and the spiritists out of the land. And the scripture says, then the Philistines gathered together and came and encamped at Shunem. So Saul gathered all Israel together and they encamped at Gilboa. When Saul saw the army of the Philistines, he was afraid and his heart was trembled. His heart trembled greatly. And verse 6. And when Saul inquired of the Lord, and notice the tragic in this passage, the Lord did not answer him either by dreams or by Urim or by the prophets. Israel finds themselves in grave problems, military problems. His leader, King Saul, is under stress. He had fought a, the wrong battle, persecuting David. Therefore, he was not prepared to fight the real battle against his enemies. He had been intimidated by David's fame with jealousy, with envy, and he persecuted him, losing the opportunity of preparing himself legitimately to fight for the people of God. David had never been his enemy, but Saul persecuted him with his army. Now, the moment comes that the Philistines surround the city of Israel and Saul has to confront this battle, the genuine battle. What is the wrong battle? Just so that we can have this part clear. The wrong battle is to persecute your brother, the hatred that is free because of what your brother is or the accomplishments or because they were chosen by God when you believe that it's a mistake because you're better than him that was Saul's problem and this is the wrong battle that he fought for years persecuting somebody who was not his enemy the devil is an expert in making us losing the objective and to make us fight the wrong battle because of envy because of um, they didn't give me the position I wanted and fighting for this types of things and this is a mistake and so 
The devil is an expert at making us lose the objective and deviate the people of God from the true objective. Our true enemy is Satan. So he deviates our attention toward things that are not, and there's no reason to fight those battles. And so when he deviates our attention, then he stays unseen, undetected, and he overcomes God's people. And so when Saul found himself in the middle of the real battle, he prayed to God. He consulted with God in verse 6. It says, But the Lord did not answer him, neither by his dreams or by Urim. The Urim was two rocks that the priests had, and they consulted God with them. And he neither spoke to Saul by his prophets. God had already spoken to Saul through Samuel. And in verse 7, look at what in his desperation he says, in the stress that he found himself in, the fear that he found himself in, because he knew that he was uh, bound to lose. He was not prepared to fight that legitimate battle because he wasted his time fighting a battle that was not legitimate. And so it says, he, then Saul said to his servants, Find me a woman who is a medium, that I may go to her and inquire of her. And his servants said to him, In fact, there is a woman who is a medium at Endor. So Saul disguised himself and put on other clothes, and he went and two men with him, and they came to the woman by night, and he said, Please conduct a seance, a science for me, and bring up for me the one I shall name to you. Wow. What a tremendous error. What a deviation of a king who was required by the people and God anointed him so that he would be the legitimate king of Israel. And that through that king that he filled with gifts and he equipped him, Saul was, he had a lot of gifts. He was a, a, a powerful warrior. He had the gift of prophecy. He prophesied amongst the prophets. But his disobedience has taken him to this spiritual decadence that when he found himself surrounded by the war without strength, without being prepared for that war, and he consulted with God, and God did not answer him. God did not answer him in any way, and he tried uh, by all means to bring the message of God to his life, but God did not answer him. And so he takes another alternative, and the other alternative is of lie, of deceit, of death. And so Saul says, find me a woman who is a medium that I may go to her and inquire of her. So his servants say, yes, there's a medium at Endor. So Saul, when Saul began his kingship, he obeyed by having, getting rid of all of the witches, all of the soothsayers, all of them who consulted with the dead. And he eliminated all of these witches. And so, though he had sent for all of the diviners to be destroyed, we can see that in his heart, he still trusted in the diviners. It may be like some who say, you know what, I've heard this before. Maybe you haven't, but I've heard people say this. Well, I've prayed, I've cried out, I have fasted, I have looked for God, and God doesn't answer me. And the problem is still the same or worse, and so they leave. And they go with the witches, they go with the curanderos, they go with the soothsayers, the diviners, and to see if they can do what God supposedly in their opinion God cannot do but let me tell you something if God can't help you then there is no human power that can help you the demons have power but they're not the all-powerful like God who can do all things and Satan who was an angel of light 
whom God created as Lucifer before he was the devil, and he gave him gifts, and he was a, a beautiful angel of light, and he rebelled against God. And so he was created. The Almighty God is the one who created Satan, not when he was Satan, but when he was Lucifer, the angel of light. And God created all of the angels, whom one third of the part of them became the demons. And so God is still the Almighty, the all powerful, the only one. And so if he does not help us, there is no power that can help us. And we should trust in his power because he has all the power. In verse 9, the scripture says, Then the woman said to him, Look, you know what Saul has done, how he has cut off the mediums and the spiritists from the land. Why then do you lay a snare for my life to cause me to die? And in verse 10, look at what Saul. And Saul swore to her by the Lord, saying, As the Lord lives, no punishment shall come upon you for this thing. Oh, Lord. So when Saul finds himself with a diviner, he swears to her that she's not going to be killed. And he does it in the name of the Lord. What a mixture in the heart of Saul. He speaks in the name of the Lord Jehovah God, but he acted in the name of the devil. That is a mixture. We cannot... There cannot be a mixture in our hearts or we trust in God or we do not trust in God or we live for God or we don't live for God or do we serve God or we serve Satan. But that mixture does not take us anywhere. It did not take Saul anywhere, uh, only to death. In verse 11, then the woman said, whom shall I bring up for you? And he said, bring up Samuel for me. So when this happens, and look at verse 12, because Samuel appears, and this is a theme, brothers and sisters, I will leave to consideration so that you will judge, so that you will judge this, what we are talking about from here on after. In verse 12, it says, And when the woman saw Samuel, she cried out with a loud voice, and the woman spoke to Saul, saying, Why have you deceived me? For you are Saul. And the king said to her, Do not be afraid. What did you see? And the woman said to Saul, I saw, I saw the Spirit ascending out of the earth. And so he said to her, What is his form? And she said, An old man is coming up, and he is covered with a mantle. And Saul perceived that it was Samuel, and he stooped with his face to the ground and bowed down. And the first thing that we see is that this diviner did not expect for Samuel to appear. She screamed. In other words, she was scared. The diviner of Endor gets scared when she sees Samuel appear. Remember that Samuel had already died in his city of birth and all of the people cried for his death. The diviner knows in her heart, she knows perfectly that she cannot bring back any man or any woman who has already died. In other, in, on the other hand, if she would have known, she would have not gotten so surprised. And so the deceit of the spirit of spiritism is that the demons appear with the appearance of a family member, of something familiar. Satan brings the demons with the appearance of the one who has died. And they speak about something that only the dead person knew. And what is the reason for this? Demon, the demons know us. They have seen us throughout our whole walk in this world. They have seen our ancestors. They know the sins of our ancestors. Why? Because the demons have incited them to commit those sins. So in other words, those spirits are familiar spirits. 
when people consult because they want to know the secrets because the grandfather died and he had a secret and they want to know that secret or where did he leave the inheritance or where did he live leave what uh, the, the hidden treasure etc etc and so they go and they consult with the spiritists and they do not see them they do not see the figures the mediums are possessed by demons and they begin to speak things that only that family member knew and we already know why it is that they have that information how do they know that information it's because the demons are on the earth since the fall and they no from generation to generation and now this chapter is a chapter difficult to understand that has been interpreted as if god tolerates witchcraft spiritism and everything that has to do with the occult which is not true we have to examine very carefully this passage to realize what is it that God is teaching us in this story? And why is it that this story comes out in the sacred book? And so we're going to read some texts, some texts from the Bible that will help us to have revelation. And so God is never going to go against his word and he's never going to contradict his word because his word is true and it's amen and that's how it is and there is nothing else to debate. And so we're going to see those verses. And so first let's go to the book of Leviticus. If you have a pen or pencil to write, write these down, pray to the Lord because God has he has one word and his word is never going to be changed he's never going to change his mind about what he said in his word so the scripture says in Leviticus 19.31 and it says give no regard to mediums and familiar spirits do not seek after them to be defiled by them I am the Lord your God. So he is the one who gives this decree. So go to chapter 20, verse 6. And it says, And the person who turns to mediums and familiar spirits to prostitute himself with them, I will set my face against that person and cut him off from his people. So as you can see, the word of the Lord is it does not give a foothold an inch to make us think that God is going to tolerate this it is it is final God does not tolerate it and he says I will cut that person off Saul was cut off so let's look in verse 6 and the person who turns to mediums and familiar I'll read it again and familiar spirits to prostitute himself with them, I will set my face against that person and cut him off from his people. So let's move forward to the book of Deuteronomy in chapter 18. And we are going to continue to show what the word of the Lord is speaking to us in this regard. And all we have to do is say, Lord, Amen. You are the only God, and outside of you, there is no more. So, Deuteronomy 18, verse 10, and it says, There shall be not found among you anyone who makes his son or daughter pass through the fire, or one who practices witchcraft, or a soothsayer, or one who interprets omens or a sorcerer or one who conjures spells or a medium or a spiritist or one who calls up the dead for all who do these things are an abomination to the lord and because of these abominations the lord your god drives them out from before you and verse 13 which is the lord's counsel you shall be blameless before the lord your God because these nations that you will dispossess listen to soothsayers and diviners but as for you people of God the Lord your God has not appointed such for you 
So as we can see, beloved in Christ, this is in the Old Testament. And you might say, well, it's another time. Now we have more knowledge. We have more advances, more technology. We can, we can be more open and have an open mind. I don't think the way that God thinks, but the scripture says that he is true and his word does not lie. And so for this, we are going to see another case in the New Testament and it is regarding this and it's going to bring more light uh, to what we are speaking. And let's go to the book of Acts in chapter 16. And we're going to see a case here that tells us that the Apostle Luke relates to us and it's an incident that happened with the Apostle Paul. Chapter 16, verse 16, and it says, Now it happened, as we went to prayer, that a certain slave girl possessed with the spirit of divination met us, who brought her masters much profit by fortune telling. This girl followed Paul and us and cried out, saying, These men are the servants of the Most High God, who proclaim to us the way of salvation. And this she did for many days. But Paul, greatly annoyed, turned and said to the Spirit, I command you, in the name of Jesus Christ, to come out of her. And he came out that very hour. And so here I believe it is very clear, beloved in Christ, the spirit of divination that was in the girl was a python spirit. It was a, it is a similar to the python snake that, that tightens up and it, it, it wraps around the person. So when the person goes to these spirits of deceit, they fall in this deceit, in these lies, and it's as if they are left, left hypnotized, believing, trapped in the lie, believing the lie instead of the truth, which is a clear deceit. And now this woman is saying a truth. And we see in verse 17, and we're going to clear this up, because this woman cried out and she said, These men are the servants of the Most High God, who proclaim to us the way of salvation. And so she is saying a truth. When that legion of demons spoke to Jesus, because that legion was inside of the gathering, Luke, Luke chapter 8, the demons spoke and they recognized who Jesus was. And they said, oh, you're the son of God. Why have you come before our time? Because they know they have a time that they're going to be cast into the lake of sulfur and fire. And so here, this woman... It, it, it better said it is not the woman it is the spirit that was in the woman is speaking truth the demons when they want to deceive they don't come with a complete lie they come with a half lie or a half truth so that they will make you fall that way and so notice that she is speaking a truth and they are servants of the Most High and they are announcing the way of salvation. But she was doing it many days behind Paul, the servants, the apostles that were going to prayer every day. And this annoyed Paul and he did not rebuke. And I want you to pay a lot of attention right here. Paul did not rebuke. He did not speak to the woman by name. He who had that python spirit, he spoke directly to the spirit, to the demon that was inside that woman. Therefore, we can see that it is not the person. We say, oh, this person is a diviner. This person is gifted. This person uh, has a gift from God. No, divination is not a gift of God. It is a spirit of demons to deceive and we have to realize because the word of the Lord is very clear and it does not leave room for doubt 
This woman had a spirit of divination, and through that demon of divination, that python spirit, she would give her master's prophet. Look at verse 23. And it says, And when they had laid many stripes on them, they threw them into prison, commanding the jailer to keep them securely. Why is Paul and the disciples in jail now? Because one reason, the masters of this woman lost their prophets. They don't have that demon of divination. And she no longer can supposedly divinate because uh, demons cannot divinate. They know what they already, they speak what they already know. And so that is how they deceive. And so now if it, if it would have been from God, I want to emphasize this. Paul would have not rebuked that demon. He would have rebuked the woman. And so I think with this, it is demonstrated that every spirit of divination proceeds from Satan and not from God. And it is prohibited, as we already read it in Leviticus 19.31, 20 verse 6, Deuteronomy 18, from 10 to 12. And I have one more scripture, which is Exodus 22.18. And Exodus 22.18 is also uh, very final. There is no agreements with the diviners, with the witchcraft. The Lord doesn't make covenant or agreements with them. The Lord is not going to. Um, and so it's going to be in Exodus chapter 22, verse 18. The Lord is not going to tolerate it. It says, you shall not permit a sorceress to live. That is why this woman was afraid. She said, oh, uh, Saul cast out all of the sorcerers, all the diviners, and she was afraid. But him in that mixture that he had, he swore by God, he swore in vain that nothing was going to happen when God had already dictated sentence against the sorcerers, diviners, and witches. So let's continue. We already know that that is the territory of the enemy. They are occult forces. They are darkness. So let's go back to 1 Samuel chapter 28. What communion does the light have with darkness, brothers and sisters? None. And so everything that is occultism is darkness. We are children of the light. And so let's go back to 1 Samuel chapter 28 and let's see what is next. In verse 15, now Samuel said to Saul, why have you disturbed me by bringing me up? And Saul answered, I am deeply distressed. For the Philistines make war against me, and God has departed from me and does not answer me anymore, neither by prophets nor by dreams. Therefore I have called you, that you may reveal to me what I should do. Then Samuel said, So why do you ask me, seeing that the Lord has departed from you and has become your enemy? And the Lord has done for himself as he spoke by me. For the Lord has torn the kingdom out of your hand and given it to your neighbor, David. Since you did not obey the voice of Jehovah God, because you did not obey the voice of the Lord, nor execute his fierce wrath upon Amalek, therefore the Lord has done this thing to you this day. Moreover, the Lord will also deliver Israel with you into the hand of the Philistines, and tomorrow you and your sons will be with me. The Lord will also deliver Israel the army of Israel into the hand of the Philistines. So here we're going to see something because here is something that if we do not look for it with the light of the scripture, one scripture will take us to another scripture to give us clarity. Remember that the Bible interprets itself and we do not need that any witch or sorcerer will come and tell us our future. Let me tell you that the word of the Lord tells us what is our future. Read at the end when you have an opportunity, the last chapters of Revelation where we see the end of the just ones, the one who the ones who accepted salvation in Christ and the, and the end of those who are unjust, who did not accept the salvation that is through Christ. So that is where our future is written. And so the Lord does not have us in darkness. He has us enlightened. And so here 
we can see that there's something that could probably bring you confusion. So do you see that Samuel is speaking here? And according to this passage. Now, where does Samuel come from? If this is truly Samuel, and we're going to leave it at the end as a question mark. Where does Samuel come from? And so we're going to see here in Luke in chapter 16, we're going to go to the New Testament. So we won't take it as something that, oh, you know, it happened in the Old Testament and not in the New. But let's go to the New Testament in chapter 16. And it is a passage that is going to give us light. Glory to the name of Jesus. And in verse 19, it says, There was a certain rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. So I'll make it short and you can read it. You can read it uh, in your own time. So there was a rich man. But there also was a man who was very poor and he used to beg. And his name was Lazarus. And that man, Lazarus, it says that he had sores all over his body and he saw how the crumbs fell from the table of the rich man. Uh, but the dogs came and he would eat the and they would eat the crumbs and he would just not even get to eat that. And it says that the dogs even licked the sores on his body. And so So they both die. The rich man dies and Lazarus dies. And in verse 22 it says, So it was that the beggar died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's bosom. So where does Samuel come from if it is Samuel? So let's take this into consideration and let's say that it is Samuel. So Samuel is coming from Abraham's bosom and the rich man also died and was buried and being in torment in Hades. And so pay attention to that word, Hades. It means the place of the dead. He lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. Then he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue for I am tormented in this flame. So we're going to stop there. And let's remember that there are two people who died here and they go to the same place and you might say well the rich man went to a place of torment and he went to Hades and Lazarus went to Abraham's bosom well Hades uh, before Christ inaugurated the kingdom of heaven when he rose again and he took captivity captive he took all of the souls that were captive no one was able to enter the glory of god or the paradise or the presence of the lord or the third heaven nobody from the fall would was able to enter directly into the presence of god nobody why because there had not been a redemption christ had not died for the sins of all humanity so when christ died the just ones would go to a place called the bosom of Abraham. And that place, Hades, was uh, divided by a great abyss. And so, and so there was two sides to it. So when Lazarus died, he went to the part of Hades, the Abraham's bosom, where, um, where he was, where he was resting in Abraham's bosom. And the rich man goes. It says that the rich man is in Hades in the same place, but it's he's on the other side of the abyss, that place of torment, being tormented by the fire. And he asks that somebody will come from where uh, Lazarus, the beggar, will come and, and dip the finger in, in his tongue so that he would be comforted from the torment that he was suffering. Nowadays, there is no more just people in Hades. Why? Because we have direct entrance into the presence of the Lord. But it is still a place as a as a as a like a waiting room so that the people who are condemned are going to go before the great white throne of judgment of the Lord. They're going to go and they're going to be condemned. And so it's not that it's God that wants to send them to hell, but it is that they rejected eternal life. Uh, through Jesus Christ, it is because they took other mediums 
just like Saul did. Instead of praying and saying, God, I'll wait on you, they went and consulted. And so they rejected God. And so, you know, hopefully, you know, some, some people prefer not to wait on God and fall into the deceiving. So going back to Samuel, God allowed him to come back from Abraham's bosom, Abraham's bosom to speak to Saul and that God allowed it. Some believe this. And, you know, Samuel said, I have nothing to tell you from God. God already spoke to you. Your kingdom was cut off because you did not obey. The first mission that he gave him, that God gave Saul was to destroy all of the Amalekites because they were going to be a stumbling block to Israel. But because of fear, because of disobedience, because of exaltation, because of whatever, he did not obey. He obeyed partially. And it is very dangerous to obey God halfway. It is very dangerous to say, well, I'm not so bad. Well, I do this right and I failed over here and not repent. And that was Saul's case. He could have repented. He could have said, yes, it's true. I, I, I sinned. I disobeyed. I brought the fat, the fat uh, of the offering of the cattle to offer or sacrifice to the Lord. But that's not what God asked of me. God asked me to destroy the Amalekites. I brought King Agag as a trophy so that they could say how powerful, oh, what a great warrior. Here's a king that has been overcome. And it was very dangerous what he did, and he never repented. Because when Samuel told him, what have you done? You have acted foolishly. You have not pleased God. And instead of repenting and instead of saying, yes, I have failed, it's true. Forgive me, Lord, and cry out for mercy. You know what he did when he... When Saul was already leaving, he pulled him from his robe. He cut a piece off of the rope. And that is when Samuel tells Saul, Today the Lord has ripped your kingdom, taken your kingdom away from you. And he begs him to go worship. He tells him, Come with me, Samuel, to worship your God. There, Saul does not even mention God as his, as his own God. But he said, go so we can worship your God so people could see that I'm spiritual that he was amongst the prophets and so what a fracture what a weakness in the heart of Saul who never wanted to correct he could have corrected these weaknesses and these fractures because God does not want the death of the sinner he doesn't want anybody to die that's why he why he gave up his only son but he wants us to admit Lord yes this is my tendencies of pride of pretending that I'm super spiritual of pretending that I'm perfect of pretending that I know all things these are very dangerous fractures that made Saul lose the kingdom we are called to be reigning with Christ together with him but we can lose the kingdom if we do not fix those tendencies that are sinful that are carnal in our heart and so beloved in Christ we are going back to this passage and I think it's understandable beloved in Christ that Samuel if this truly is Samuel is because God allowed it if it is Samuel it's because God allowed it he doesn't come because of the div the 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 divinate the divinator of Endor and so we're gonna see in first Samuel First Samuel 28, 20, it says, Immediately Saul fell full length on the ground, and he was a big man. So we could say that was a great fall. The more we arise, you know, the harder the fall. And so he fell full length on the ground and was dreadfully afraid because of the words of Samuel. And there was no strength in him, for he had eaten no food all day or night and the woman came to Saul and saw that he was severely troubled and said to him look your maid servant has obeyed your voice and I have put my life in my hands and heed the words which you spoke to me so here is the enemy uh, dressed up with mercy now therefore please 
Heed the voice of your maidservant and let me set a piece of bread before you and eat that you may have strength. So is it that she was all of a sudden a good person? No. It just wasn't good for her, for Saul to die in her house, in her place. She could be accused of his death. Thirdly, it was not an act of kindness. All she wanted to do was to protect herself because she would be discovered that there was a diviner hidden in indoors. So Saul is in pieces and her in her um, deceiving used her. And you know that the devil knows how to give you counsel. He knows how to act like he has compassion. And people could come and tell you, oh, you know, I have compassion on you. I'm going to take you to this place or that place because I care for you because I want to help you. But that is false mercy from the enemy. Now, the genuine advice from God is when we do not know where to go, when we are confused, when we are in tribulation, sad, broken, in anguish, let's not run to deceit. That is the advice. Do not run to deceit. Many. You know, hopefully, hopefully nobody has that tendency to run to drugs as an escape to alcohol. As Christians, we, we, you know, we as Christians, we say we run to the mall. And what's the consequence? Come back in debt? <laughs> with uh, debt that we didn't have before now all of a sudden we have debt because we want to get distracted and because we want to forget about the pain and we want to uh, just go out and and try to get things to cover up our pain and and we say oh you know um i, I got something i bought something but you know you're always going to get the bill after you go shopping and so and so these types of things give us momentary, momentary pleasure. But let's remember, there's a, a story in Daniel, and Daniel has nocturnal visions that he cannot understand, and he's left, you know, with troubled every time he has them. And so it says that he fell as a dead man in one of these visions. And it says, and an angel came and tells Daniel, do not fear, wait upon the Lord. This is the advice from the Lord. When you don't know where to go or that you believe that God has failed you, God is never going to fail you. But God has his time and we have to wait no matter how tormented, no matter how much problems or how much pain we're going through. And we say, I can't take it anymore. God, let me tell you, he will not put more of a weight on us than what we can bear. That is what his word says. And that is true. And even though you're in pain and you're still putting up with it, you are still there. Well, it means that it's time to continue to wait on the Lord. And so the way out to our problems is never going to be to run to the soothsayers, to the witches, to the Ouija board, to the instruments of the devil. The solution is to run to Christ, to his feet and say, Lord, the Lord lives. I will not let you go until you answer me. Pressing and holding on to Christ. That is the solution. He is the only one who can set us on our feet. Daniel was laid out like a dead man. You know, Saul did not fall before the presence of God. He fell because of the own weight of his sin. Down to the earth after hearing the truth that awaits everyone who is disobedient only death god is always going to speak to us in the place of brokenness so if you're broken if you're going through tribulation if you feel that you can't take it anymore and you say that this is it i can't no more in that place of brokenness is where god speaks to us that is where we can hear his voice that is where we can be comforted blessed are those who mourn for they shall be comforted how beautiful that we can have that comfort in the midst of our pain yes we cry yes many times we also might even kick and throw tantrums and 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 we do so many weird things but one of the things that has left and been engraved in my heart is 
the case of the woman of Shunem, who she holds on to the man of God. And she came in bitterness of spirit and she stood at his feet and she didn't let go. And she said, as the Lord lives, I will not let you go. And she did not let go of the prophet of God. Why? Because God is the only one that has the answer. And so what was the reward of this woman, this woman of faith? The Lord rose her son again. So, beloved in Christ, if now he is the only one that can lift us up. We need to go to the place of humility. Lord, I am broken. I've sinned against you. I've been foolish. I've been disobedient. I have not obeyed your word. I have been a lukewarm, halfway Christian. I have been a Christian who has obeyed you partially, not 100%, but Lord, here I am. I am humbled. I am eating dust, just like David ate dust when he humbled himself before God in dust and in ashes. And that is when the Lord will come and lift us up. That's when his mighty hand, because he's the almighty God, he comes and he lifts us up because he sees us humbled, believing, waiting upon his promises. Though we're afflicted, though we're in pain, Pain, though we're in sickness, though death seems that is knocking at our door day by day, if we are there trusting, He is going to raise us up. He is always going to raise us up. Look at Lazarus. He was he was raised up to the bosom of Abraham, the place of rest where there is no more pain, no more tribulation, the place where all of the evil of this world will not reach us any longer. So let's remember the process of the butterfly. And it's a, a nasty worm that becomes a beautiful butterfly full of colors and flying, soaring into the heights. But the process is painful. You know, that worm that drags itself, that is in that tremendous humiliation, has to fight, has to force itself to break the cocoon. I said Cancun. Okay, so I'm thinking about a vacation. <laughs> But we can't go out right now, so <laughs> so forget that thought. <laughs> so, so the little shell that, that they're in, um, or the cocoon, um, and so it hurts to be in there. But without that pain, if we do not have that strength in us, that that comes out when we're locked in in that pain you know then we're not going to have that beautiful transformation process like the beautiful butterfly who breaks free and flies colorful into the heights now the eagle also has its process you know that eagle it it flies all the way to the heights into the into the rocks that are sharp and and it it wounds itself and it breaks its own beak because when it's young, that beak is straight. But when it's old, the eagle's beak is curved down and it can no longer eat and it can no longer fly because of the heaviness of the weight of the feathers. And so it can no longer fly and defend itself from its predators. And so it knows, the eagle knows that if it does not renew itself, it's going to die. And so the eagle takes a decision. It makes a decision to either let itself die or to renovate itself. And the process of the eagle is very painful. You could see the stains of the blood on the rock, on that high rock. And, and she's left without being able to see because she has to, or he has to break off its beak so that a new one will break out. And so a very painful process. But the Lord compares us to the eagles. He compares us to these eagles. And there is a scripture in Matthew, and I always used to ask, and I never got a answer but now it's understandable when i see the process of the eagle and it says where the body is that is where the eagles will gather and when christ comes in glory all of the eagles who have been transformed in that painful process are going to gather to the encounter of our god and so let's not be afraid and let's not look for false ways out and so saul took the food that the witch gave him and, you know, it made him feel better. And the enemy makes us feel for a little while. But that was not the answer of God. And it could be that what you look for outside of God can give you a little bit of relief. It's true. 
it'll relieve you for a little bit. And and we see in David also, he's in Akish and he's in a temporary relief, but we're going to see in the next um, chapters how the adjustments of accounts comes for David too. So Saul took that temporary relief. And yes, he ate what this witch, what this sorcerer, what this soothsayer, whatever she was, offered him. But let's not get desperate. Let's wait on God. Though danger is around us, though pain, those testings, though trials, tribulations come, we know that when we are humbled before the Lord, His hand picks us up. And so let's remember, beloved in Christ, this passage, it is a difficult passage to understand and um, maybe it's just a isolated case um, that actually this case is, is nothing like it repeated in the scripture. You cannot find. Uh, now, if it was Samuel that was in the bosom of Abraham for, for him to come back, it, it is a unique case. And so it doesn't, it never repeated itself and it's not going to repeat itself. And maybe God allowed it as something unique to show us that it was not the power of the diviner that made Samuel come back, but that God himself brought him to confirm the sentence of death to Saul, that in his, um, in his craziness and in his rebellion, he went to consult this witch. And so if it is Samuel that is truly there, it is a unique case. It did not repeat itself and it will not repeat itself again. And in the case of the divinate, divinator it, that had that spirit that Paul confronted, it clears us up. It clears to us. It clears up to us that she spoke or the spirit spoke saying that they were servants of God. And so... The people knew that Paul was a man of God. The disciples that were with Paul in that moment also knew that um, he was a man of God. And so it was a truth that many people knew, but this diviner was doing it to bring herself publicity and she wanted to call the attention. And so that is what the demons want. They just want to get the attention. Conclusion, it is not an innocent game, beloved in Christ, to play uh, with a Ouija board or to go with the diviners to get the the horoscope and the and the palm of their hand read or the coffee or the tea or whatever it may be um, or the worship of vitals which is witchcraft also be very careful with what you take inside your home these uh, good luck charms that we say they're going to help us they might seem inoffensive but the devil's not playing to be a devil he is a devil and devil, diabolos, means the adversary of God, the one who is against of God, and he is against you and wants to take your soul to hell. And so Revelation, we're going to read this scripture in the book of Revelation that confirms what I am speaking, that in the last days, this was going to be multiplied. And we are in the last days, and more than ever, it is being multiplied. And if before... The, you know, the sorcerers had to be uh, hidden. Not any longer. They don't hide anymore. <laughs> they, they're not hidden anymore. They've got propaganda everywhere. And this shows to us the end of times. Revelation chapter 9 verse 20 says, But the rest of mankind who were not killed by these plagues. Now, if there is plagues in this moment, it is a call of God of mercy that we will repent of our sins. And if you don't know Christ, come to Christ. He doesn't want you to die. And he doesn't want you to be condemned. He died so that you would not be condemned. But it says that the men are not going to repent. Even with the plagues. It says, they did not repent of the works of their hands. That they should not worship the demons and idols of gold and silver and brass and stone and wood. Which can neither see nor hear nor walk. And they did not repent of their murders or their sorceries or their sexual immorality or their thefts. As you can see, nowadays we see with how much liberty the occult forces are practiced. With what liberty the witches act. Satanism. 
They do not hide sin. They do not hide. They publicize themselves freely. And they attack those who don't think like them. They treat us as if we're controlling, manipulating, that we want to brainwash people. But no, not really, because God gave us a free will. You decide and I decide. Each one of us has that free will to decide where do we want to spend eternity because there's only two ways. And as I read to you in Revelation, I suggested that you would read Revelation and it speaks to us more clearly about the end of those who heard the advice of God, the direction of the Holy Spirit, and those who did not want to hear it. So let's wait on the Lord, Jehovah, beloved in Christ. Let's, if we feel stressed out, weak, fallen, wait on the Lord. He's never failed us. He's never going to fail us. But he has his time. And in that process, we are being renewed like the eagles. Remember that this tribulation, no matter how difficult it is, is temporary. This pain, this suffering that we might go through during this time will have a greater weight of glory when we get to His presence. Psalm 125, verse 1 and 2, it says, Those who trust in the Lord are like Mount Zion, which cannot be moved but abides forever. As the mountain surrounds Jerusalem, so the Lord surrounds His people from this time forth and forever. It's beautiful to trust in the Lord and let that word be in your heart. You know, this verse is the first one that, the very first one that I learned when the Lord had mercy on me, when He found a woman who was destroyed, a woman who had suicidal desires and thoughts. And um, a woman who had no hope without hope. Yes, I had a religion. Uh, fanatic, yes, I was, but didn't know the truth of the word of the Lord. And that truth, I did not know it. And since I didn't know it, I lived like Saul, obeying certain parts and disobeying other things that were abomination to the Lord. And in Isaiah chapter 40, verse 30, it says, even the youth shall faint and be weary, and the young men shall utterly fall. But those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Hallelujah. The word of the Lord is so beautiful. Wait on God, beloved. If you don't know Christ, if you do not know who the God I'm speaking to you about, it's really simple. He hears you because he knows you. And he's waiting for you to say, Lord, I don't know you. I didn't say, I didn't used to say, Lord. I used to say God because I didn't know him. Now I say, Lord, because he's my master. He's my everything. So you could say to him, God, he heard me when I, say, when I said, God, forgive my sins. And one day the Holy Spirit touched me and I said, Lord, forgive my sins from the day that I was born. He was so beautiful. It was such a brief prayer, but it was so beautiful that my life changed there. He baptized me with his Holy Spirit and I was not in a Christian church or a Pentecostal church so that I could be predisposed in my mind. No, I didn't even know there was a spirit that can baptize you in such a beautiful way. So, beloved in Christ, if you are in the Lord and you're living like Saul half ways, you need to be careful. And if you don't know God, look at the mercy of God is so great for you to come to his feet, for you to come to ask him forgiveness for your sins. Wait on God. Let's wait on his promises. Do not write, do not run to what is false. Run to the true and living and only unique God. Because outside of Jehovah God, there is no other God. And remember that we have a prophetic word because the people of God want to hear a prophetic word. Nowadays, they want, like Saul, it is not enough with the word of God. It is not enough what is already written. They want to hear. And so, and so they go to the false prophets. And that's why Saul, he knew that Samuel was a true prophet of God. But Samuel was already dead. He was already dead. 
And so, since this was a unique case or only case, it's not that we're going to say, Lord, send Samuel to me or send to me Elijah, the prophet of fire. Send me on any other prophet. No, because there in Luke chapter 16, the rich man asked for somebody from there that is the Abraham's bosom to go over there. And he says, no, they, they have over there on earth, they have the prophets and they need to hear them. And so, if you have that weakness of wanting to hear a prophetic word from the Lord, look at what Second Peter says. And with this, I will end. And this is a theme that has to be really, really um, explained without a doubt, that you are left without the shadow of a doubt. So Second Peter chapter 2, verse 17, it says, These are wells without water. Clouds carried by a tempest, for whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. Speaking of the false prophets, and this is in context of the prophecy that Balaam, he gave the wrong counsel to make the people of God fall. For when they speak great swelling words of emptiness, they allure through the lust of the flesh, through lewdness, the ones who have actually escaped from those who live in error. So they try to deceive with false prophecies those who had already escaped from the error. They try to seduce them back with falsehood. So the secure 100% prophetic word that is not going to make us fall is what it is written already. And this word finishes with an amen. In other words, period. There's nothing more. There's nothing more you can add to it. And Revelation says, he says, and if in, and those who keep the words of the book worship God says if anyone adds I'm sorry it says and he who adds or takes away let them be cursed and the Bible ends in verse 20 it says he who testifies to these things says surely I am coming quickly and he is true amen even so come Lord Jesus the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. So let every man be a liar, but God, God never lies. And lastly, beloved, I leave you with this. You judge this case. Samuel came from God as a unique case, or was it the diviner or the sorcerer in, and door is witness for the first time of a demon taking the form of Samuel, you be the judge. Because if it was Samuel coming from God, it is a unique case that will never ha happen again. The Bible doesn't mention another case. And if it is that for the first time, this diviner who was demon-possessed and that demon that appeared took the form of Samuel, if it was Samuel, look, he didn't say, and it, he, if it was it was he didn't say anything different that was already written so you be the judge and what is clear is that god prohibits the practice of spiritism and it is to consult with the dead occultism the tarot the good luck charms the worship of idols of any kind of material all of these things, witchcraft, sorcery, all of these things are an abomination to God. Read Exodus 20. You could read the Ten Commandments. It says, you shall not have other gods before me, and you shall not make any images of anything that is in the heaven, the earth, or beneath the earth, because God abhors this. God hates this. And so, only Jesus is God, and besides him, there is no other God who can save us. And if in the past you consulted with diviners, spiritists, or any practices that are from the occult or that we have mentioned, come to Christ and He will forgive all your sins. He died for all of our sins. He does not condemn us. He wants us to come because He's the only one that can give us salvation. Now, how do you come to Him? You ask Him for forgiveness. You did it because of ignorance. Even, you know, you're in Christ and somebody gave you a little good luck charm or a little uh, something that you might have. You know, you should clean your house from all these things. And God 
told Hezekiah, go clean your house, put your house in order, get rid of those things that can offend God. And God is willing to forgive our sins when we repent from our hearts. God is listening. You're not speaking to a dead God. God is alive. He rose again on the third day and he's sitting at the right hand of the Father, praying, interceding, Lord, I've sinned. When we speak to him and we confess our sins, our God is not a dead God. Our God is a God that is alive. Jesus Christ is alive and he lives forevermore. Amen. God bless you. of 
So.